Welcome to Quarantine Time. I am Science Mom, this is Math Dad, and we are talking about maps and navigation today and a little bit about geography too. So that is our science lesson. And then for our math lesson, we're going to be talking about symmetry. Should be fun. Yeah. I wanna... I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Maps are kind of cool. Cartography is a legitimate science and it's crazy how important it is and how much we take it for granted today. Super important, super important. I wanna give a thank you to those who are joining us live and a special welcome to you if you're watching the replay. Hello to, we've got Science Mom Amber and Owen and Haley, Kaylee, Nathan and Raya. Casey. Hello from to Aisha from Vermont, to Minor Master, to Owen from California, Larissa, to Sophie in Clemson, Clemson, South Carolina, Pixel B8 from California, Starlight Night from Florida, Hello to Blanca Morales, King Husky, PPC Builders from Nevada, Maureen from Texas, and to Anne from Minnesota. It is so good to see you all here with us this morning, ready to learn some science. Hi, Aliyah so, Aftermauer. So let's talk about, let's talk about maps. And first, I want to talk a little bit about the map of our world that we typically see. I'm going to share an image with you that is quite old. This is a real map that was drawn back in the early 1700s Whoa. or no 1600s actually so, so, yep yeah 17th so century they they haven't yet finished a drawing north america because so much of it was unknown they didn't know what it looked like because nobody <laughs> you know nobody with the map making skills and the navigation of having explored the rest of the world had been to that northern part part of north america yet and so the map looks a little incomplete to us and there's several several things that are missing, including um, Antarctica looks quite quite different. Indeed, Man, it's kind of crazy because just because I visited a place doesn't mean I could draw a map of it. I, lucky if I could even describe it. Like, ah, oh, there were some hills, and <laughs> you know, I think we went, crossed a river at one point. But I mean, map makers really have to be on the ball and they've got to get their measurements right. Yeah, we, we take for granted nowadays, because nowadays when you want to go somewhere, a lot of people will just ask their phone to tell them how to get there. And then your phone, using a GPS, your phone will navigate you there, and you don't have to ever look at a map. But back in the day, before people had cell phones, maps were how you got from one place to another. And if there was a mistake on the map, then you might get lost. I'm going to grab our 3D map of the world. And this is the best map of the world, of course. It's actually... 3D, it's a, a globe, so nothing is distorted. This The sizes are right. And man, that Pacific Ocean is big. It is. Looking at it head on, you can almost see no land on either side. So this is a cool fact. There are some planets that have a different view from one side from the other. They're almost like, you know, like two halves look different. Our planet is one of them. Because if you approached Earth from here, you would think, hang on, that's just a planet of water. There's only ocean. It's an ocean planet. And it wouldn't be until it started to rotate that you'd be like, oh, there are, there are some, there's some landforms. Yep, yep. I see land now. But then when you get back to here, it really does look like our planet is just water. You can see New Zealand, you can see Hawaii if you, you know, are zoomed in real close. But North America and Australia are pretty close to being hidden from view. You really can't see them very well if you're looking at Earth from this point of view. My now, understanding is that Earth is actually shines brighter than it should for a planet of its size just because of all the reflective surface on it. It does. It does. It is quite quite a bright planet because it has so much water and the clouds which reflect light. Now let's talk about how you take this information and make it two-dimensional. Uh oh, before we do that, though, I actually have a riddle that I, I, I need to ask. All right, so, so th this is one of, one of my favorite problems to give. All right, so... From where on Earth can you travel one mile south, one mile east, one mile north, and be back in the same place? So let me ask that question again. From where on Earth can you travel one mile south, one mile east, one mile north, but be back where you started? And, and I know it, it, it turns out there's a solution to this, and actually maybe even more than one solution. And I'm not going to give the answer now. I want you to think about it. And we'll, and we'll, we'll come back to it. And I know for sure it's not Las Vegas, close to where we live, because if we go one mile south, one mile east, and then one mile north, we're going to end up pretty close to a mile away from our house. Yep. 
it's not going to work. But yeah, they, they, it wouldn't work on a flat plane for sure. But it turns out on the globe, there are solutions to this. All right. All right, let's talk a little bit about how we get a map of a round object to be flat. Because this would not be very practical. If you wanted a map of the world and you were, you know, say you were flying around the globe, pulling this out of your pocket is not nearly as useful as pulling up something that is flat. So let's take a look at a flat map. This is one of the most common that you've probably seen before, and there are a couple things to point out. First, Greenland looks huge, yeah. and so does Antarctica. And if we hide that view and then bring back our 3D map, let's just kind of compare real quick. So look right there that Greenland looks about the size of South America. So, yeah, Greenland is that big white one up in the top there. Yeah, and it looks like it was as big as South America. And now let's look at Greenland. Here's Greenland. It is pretty big, but is it as big as this? No, South America is way bigger. Africa is way bigger too. And Greenland is a lot smaller than both of those. But yeah. when we try to take this and make a two-dimensional map, we have to kind of stretch it out to make it fit. So that square version is one way to do it. I think they call that the Mercator projection, the one we showed there, and it's it's known for distorting. It's, it really the, distorts. And up it makes, the north and down south. Yeah, and the middle too. It makes Africa look smaller than Africa actually is. Um, here is another version, which is a little bit better than that square one, but still not not perfect. This one is actually one of the best. Yeah, so they, here they've basically taken this globe that we were holding up, they've sliced it up, or just, just cut it out with a pair of scissors and tried to flatten it out. And yeah, the, the actual sizes there seem to match up pretty well because they, they cut the globe. Of course, you can't exactly flatten it. There would be wrinkles and things. So, so they've, they've done the best they can. But as weird as that looks, at least you can see, oh, I could kind of fold that together and ma make a globe out of that shape. Yeah. You, you could. You could see how you could sort of piece it together and make something round. Now let's talk just a little oh. bit about, oh, go ahead. One more, one more, actually. So. I was looking this up. What is the best map projection? And apparently in 1999, uh, there was a big contest. Oh, I love this one. And yeah, here, here was the winner. And I closed the tab that had the name. So, oh, whoops. Yeah, we'll, we'll leave it a mystery for now. It wasn't one I, I'd heard of before, but apparently this one can be folded into a tetrahedron. But the, just about everything is. Is proportioned it, the right way. That, that, that's right. It doesn't it doesn't skew things too much. Yeah, and, but it's, it's kind of crazy that we have to, to do, do these contortions just to lay out a map of the earth, but that's the what happens when you're going from a three-dimensional surface down to a 2D surface. Now, I want to talk a little bit about different types of map because the maps, the pictures that we just showed you, that last one, every country was a different color because it's a political map. It's a geopolitical map, and so you know, you look at you look at somewhere like um, South America, and you'll see all these different colors because it's divided into you know different countries claim different land. But my favorite type of map is a a geographic map, one that just shows you the different climates and what is growing where. Because if if you're a bird flying over South America, you really don't care if you're in Argentina or Brazil. You know, it's it's just it's forest and it's land, and you're going from one habitat to another. But seeing where the green is where the jungle is, and then seeing where drier areas are is really interesting because there's a pattern to our planet. And the pattern is that around the equator, we have jungle because there is a lot of rain. So if you're looking right around the equator, the center line here, you're gonna find a lot of green. But then if you go up 30 degrees or below 30 degrees, you get desert. And that's because of these circulation cells where the hot air at the equator rises up and it, when it rises up, it cools and forms clouds. And then as it comes down about 30 degrees away from the equator, you end up with deserts and all the major desert systems run around 30 degrees. We live at kind of at the top end of one of them. We live in the Mojave Desert and the Mojave and the Sonoran Deserts here through Mexico and the bottom part of America, they're part of that system. And then, of course, if you come over here, the Sahara Desert is probably the most famous desert on our planet. Again, right around 30 degrees. But look, what do you see below this belt of green? You see another desert. Mm -hmm. And it's the same It's the same thing over in South America. You see all this green, and then down here, another desert. And then, of course, Australia has some dry desert area as well. 
Isn't that cool? Well, that is pretty cool. So uh, I, I didn't realize there was something magical about 30 degrees. Yeah, there. yeah, the 30 degrees is pretty cool. And now I have a question for you guys watching in the chat. So I bet you all knew that this central line around the globe is called the equator. But what about a central line from north to south? What do you think that is called? If you know the answer, put it in the chat. Mm, I know that's a good question. Central line from north to south. south. <laughs> and Akiko asks, why is Greenland white? It's because it's usually covered in snow. And so, they did the same thing with Antarctica. Antarctica is white down here because it usually has snow. So they, they shouldn't have named it Greenland. Nope. I'm not seeing the answer yet. I'm seeing several people say, I don't know. An unquater? Unquater. That's, I like that guess. creativity. Prime Meridian. Good job, Mickey and Marin. It is called the Prime Meridian. So if you printed out the handout for today, you have a little map here where you see the equator and then the Prime Meridian. Well, in particular, so all of those lines from the north south to south were meridians. The Prime Meridian is a specific one of the meridians. Mm -hmm. uh, Sometimes they passes through Greenwich, England, if I remember right. They, they're like, huh, well, we're designing this map. We'll, we'll be the ones to decide <laughs> That's right. where the prime meridian is. Yep, yep. If you're the one who's doing all the map making, then you get special privileges. And the, the British took advantage of that and said, the prime meridian goes right through here. <laughs> now, you'll also hear those lines called by longitude or latitude. And when I was in elementary school, I remember my teacher saying that longitude lines are long. They go up and down. And latitude are flat. Sounds kind of like la, flat. And they go <laughs> this way. Okay. And that's that's a good way to remember. Longitude is north-south. Latitude is east-west. Oh, that, that is cool. Well, let me ask you this, though. If you take the globe and set it on its side, do the lines of latitude become the lines of longitude and the lines of longitude become lines of latitude? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Do you know or did you just make that question up? No, no, no. Th th this is a really good question because... Okay, getting back to my riddle now. This is probably a, a, a good time to, to answer it. I, I, I once asked this to a, a buddy of mine, and he's like, I don't know, the East Pole? And I just kind of stared at him for a minute. The East Pole? Like, do, do you really think there's an East Pole? Because there's a North Pole, there's a South Pole. There is not an East Pole. Why is there not an East Pole? Uh, this is a good question. Yeah, okay, well... Let's, if, with the North Pole, you can travel north once you get to the top of the planet. That's, that's the North Pole. You can't go further north. East, west, those directions, they just keep going. You could go east forever, and you'd, you'd keep wrapping around the globe over and over again. Well, and the reason that you get to the North Pole and then you can't go further north is because the Earth is a giant magnet, and we actually have a magnetic field coming up out of the North Pole. And the South Pole. But th th that's true. And the, the north on the map is based off of magnetic north, even though they, they don't always align because magnetic north is actually moving yeah. th throughout time. But yeah, the lines of longitude, these vertical lines, they're like orange slices. In the, so they, they meet at the top, they're wedge shaped. And as you get closer to the North Pole, those lines of longitude are getting closer to each other. Whereas the lines of latitude, those are. Uh, equally spaced as far as this this distance between them goes that mm. they're not getting closer that so that, that's why you can go east forever you can't go north or south forever just because of the, the way we've defined our, our maps and it's all based off of the rotation of the earth and yeah so that the axis of rotation determines what's the furthest north you can go what's the furthest south you can go whereas east west you can just keep going around just keep going. forever and ever and okay, so the solution to the riddle. So wh where on earth can you travel one mile south, one mile east, east, one mile north, and be back in the same place? And so the answer is at the North Pole. And I saw a couple people put that answer in the chat. So good job, guys. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try this. I got my, my North Pole here, and I'm gonna make it a really big mile here. So you go one mile south, one mile east, one mile north, but you're going to be back in the North Pole. So if you if you went one mile south of the North Pole and traveled east, you're still just one mile south of the North Pole because we're wrapping around this top point of the circle. Now, it turns out that's not the only solution to the riddle. There are infinitely many solutions to the riddle. Infinitely many? That, that's right. As you start approaching the South Pole, 
So th there's some place where if you go a mile south, you would go around the Earth one time in a mile as you went east, and then one mile north, and you'd be back in the same place. So one more time, you, if you went one mile south, and then uh, there's you some- You were so close to the South Pole that you could make a circle around it. That, that, that's right. So yeah, you're, th there is a place where the east-west circumference of the Earth is just one mile. So you go around one mile, and then you'd go back up, and you'd be in the same spot. Well, a little bit below that, there's a place where if you went down, so south a mile, you would go around exactly twice and then back up to the same spot. And yeah, so there are actually these, this sequence of circles as you get really close to the South Pole, where if you traveled one mile south, one mile east, one mile north, you'd be back in the exact same spot. And that's because when you did the mile east, you literally came back to where you had started traveling east. So yeah, that's one of my favorite riddles because Boy, you, 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 I think a lot of people eventually guess, oh, the North Pole, that should work. But very few people would think of using the South Pole. So, so in summary, there is definitely some asymmetry. You can't just turn the Earth on its side and have the lines of latitude become lines of longitude and vice versa, because the lines of longitude always intersect at the poles. They meet. Whereas these lines of latitude, they're not getting closer to each other no matter where you travel. Do you want to know a cool fact about the lines of latitude as you go south? So Antarctica here is circular and it's at the bottom of the earth and by the way that the earth spins, that means you get some crazy fast currents around Antarctica. We call them the circumpolar currents. And they are so fast that they actually have names for the lines of latitude as you go down. So you have the roaring 40s, I think, no, the roaring, I just conflated two things. The screaming 60s, and the screaming 60s is one of them. And then the the 50s and the 40s, they're, oh. they, they just, the, the ocean gets rougher and rougher as you go south towards Antarctica. And it's constantly windy there because of the way that the currents go around. But that, that, that last one here really is a pretty tight circle just around Antarctica. And now we have kind of a fun little contest to introduce the idea of topographic maps. Ooh, I, I love contour graph. Contour plots. So let me show you real quick a topo map of one of my favorite national parks, Death Valley. And I'll tell you kind of a funny story about, about being in, in Death Valley. Death Valley is enormous. It is about the size of the state of Connecticut. That is how big it is. So shout out to anyone who is from Connecticut watching today. Death Valley is a national park almost as big as your state. And because it is so big, and because the scale of maps, sometimes when people look at a map, they're used to looking at a smaller map. It's not very uncommon for people to start driving through Death Valley and think like, oh yeah, we'll just, we'll just drive up here. See on the map, it doesn't look that far. And then, you know, three hours later, they're still driving and they're thinking, when am I ever going to get there? <laughs> and one time I, I was, I was driving out to, in Death Valley on a dirt road. We were going camping and this convertible passed us and then about a half hour later came back the other way and a person with a foreign accent who was from a different country rolled down their window and said how far is it to this place and showed me on the map where they were trying to go and I said at least four hours <laughs> and their jaw dropped and they said I thought we could get there in an hour so there's there are two really important things you want to look at on a map and one is the scale you know how far does that distance translate to in real life and then with topographic maps, you actually have the elevation on your map as well. So Math Dad and I did a fun little, prepared a fun little challenge before we started this. I made a topographic map out of Play-Doh. I made an actual three-dimensional structure and then I drew a topo map for it. And I'm gonna see if Math Dad can change it back and with a ball of Play-Doh, if he can make it back into a mountain. So, Matt, Dad, I'm going to have you leave the room for just a minute, or if you want, you can like plug your ears and. Oh, you're, you're, you're going to. Because I'm going to, I'm going to show them what I made, right. and then we're going to see if you can create it. I made one for you too, although I haven't yet turned it into a topo map. All right. So, All right. here is my 3D map. It looks a little bit ridiculous. It looks kind of like a birthday cake, and I can hear Matt, Dad, outside. He's whistling so that he doesn't get any hints. So it's three super ridiculously steep mountains. And then we have a river that goes down the middle and there's a canyon. And this is the map I made. And now the challenge is to see if Math Dad can recreate it. 
When you make a topographic map, you have a line for every level of elevation. So I tried to draw with markers to help me draw my map. With markers, I just drew lines around here and then here, and then I just kept going down. And I want to point out a couple cool things that you'll see. So first, if I turn my Plato creation sideways, you'll see that my mountains look like rings of circles going down. And then the canyon, you can see the canyon where it's steep, the lines are closer together. And then here where it's steep, the lines are closer together. And then where you have the gentle part, the lines are spread further out. So I'm going to put this down here and hide it again. And then I'm going to show you the map I made. It looks kind of kind of strange. It sort of reminds me of like a Nintendo controller that has melted in the sun. That's kind of what it looks like to me. But we've got those three mountains and then my river. And then you can see that it's steep over here and it's less steep here. Now we're going to give this to Math Dad and see what he makes out of Play-Doh. And we're going to see if his Play-Doh creation looks anything like the real thing. All right, Math Dad, come on in. All right. So here is your topo map. What do you think it looks like? An alien. An alien? <laughs> yeah. Are you ready to take this and make a Play-Doh creation that's the three-dimensional version of this? I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. Come take a seat. All and... right. So one, one thing I've got to say when, when, when I look at this, I actually don't know. I, I know there are different elevations at neighboring regions. I don't know whether we're going up or down. Some of them, um, could, they, they could be so this, mountains or lakes or yeah, valleys. You actually don't know unless the map has labeled it, which is would have been nice. But, <laughs> I'll, but, I'll, okay. I'll label it for you real fast. Um, no, no, you. So this, or do you not want to know? I don't know. It might be kind of fun. We'll, we'll, All we'll, right. we'll, we'll see there you go. if, Good if luck. it works out. Maybe I've understood it. Maybe, maybe I haven't. Um, okay. And then... While I'm working on this, I got a, I've got a challenge for science mom because I too made a little thing. It's like a face with, with horns or something. I don't, uh, yeah. So I am going to have science mom see if she can draw a topographical map of this. I call this a contour graph, contour plot. And I'm going to actually see if she can draw, I want, I want her to draw four little contour maps. One of them is going to be the correct answer and the others are going to be incorrect. And she's going to see if she can fool me, see if I can identify the correct one. All right. So, all right. What, so, oh, so I've behind there. This. Yep. You've got your map. You right. have a bowl of Play-Doh. All right. Maybe, maybe they, we should point this at you so they can watch you attempt to draw my... Oh, on the whiteboard. On the, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, do it on the whiteboard that way. All right. And you can, you can talk them through it. And that'll give me time to, to work here. Where is our eraser? There it is. Is this the scale? So Math Dad's map here <laughs> is kind of a funny one. So we've got, yeah, it really, we've got like the two mountains here. So I'm gonna, if I were to like dip it in paint just a little bit, then these two spots here would definitely be the highest spots. So I'm gonna draw two little circles. And then as we go down uh, with elevation, we are going to get to a point where the elevation is kind of the same in between. So then we get like kind of a loop around. And then these are interesting because this is kind of like the opposite. These are holes that go down and so we're gonna get sort of a circle here and a circle here going down and same thing here. And for this to be a map that I could read, we would definitely want to have elevation lines. So let's say that this is, you know, 10 feet above ground and then this would be 20 and this would be 30 and that would be 40 and that would be 50. And then we have kind of like a little ridge here and then we have, boy, this looks really weird, guy, guys. <laughs> okay, that kind of looks like some sort of giant, giant alien. <laughs> so I, I totally like what what you're doing better. I think that you should have not shown me this and see, then seen if I could recreate it. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, no. Deepa that, says it looks like a pig. It does kind of look like a pig. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now I'm going to try and, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make, I'm going to change it up here. I just want to start over. It's not working. <laughs> I'm gonna show you show you math dad struggling. Play-Doh is tough. It doesn't do what I want it to do. I feel like I've got a pretty good handle on your shape. It's pretty obvious, but it's it's a sticky play-doh, that's what it is. It's sticky <laughs> play-doh. I'm, I'm starting over. Alright. First one doesn't count. We all know that. Alright. Doubling my amount of play-doh too. So you made this too big. Too big. Okay. So, so yeah. This is my low point, and then I've got to make hills on each side, and then it should go up. But the high point is not the outer edge, it's right there ish. Should be a, maybe some peaks there. I'm going to make that one a lake, and something like this is going on. So, gradual slope. Not bad, Matt. Dad, not bad. Should we show him? Should we show him the real version? All right, you were supposed to build it on top of this, then you could lift it up. Here, just stick it on top of that. All right. But I forgot to tell you that. All right. Now we'll show him the real version. And because my map did not tell you whether elevation was increasing and decreasing, it totally made sense for Math Dad to think, well, maybe that middle one is a lake going ah. deeper. But I had three mountains and then a canyon. And Math Dad did two mountains, a lake and a canyon. Yeah, I didn't make my my mountain's tall enough, but of course, I don't know, are these all equally spaced? Maybe mine's the true map. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of a fun exercise and yeah, not, not you know terribly this... easy, but yeah, you can pull out a potato and carve it up and you can try to map where these contour lines would be, where these elevation lines are. And it's a really neat exercise and it's not so cool that you can turn something that was three dimensional down to two dimensions, yet, it doesn't take too much practice to be able to visualize these pretty well. So uh, this reminds me of the game of telephone, where you'll sit, whisper something to someone's ear, and then they'll whisper it to someone else, and they'll whisper it to someone else, and you start out with one message, but by the time you get to the end, it might be different. So this is kind of the same way, but instead of whispering a message, you're translating from two dimensions to three dimensions. And if you want to do a fun kind of family challenge, have someone make a topographical map, like a not, not a topo map, have someone make a three-dimensional map and then translate it into a topo map and see if someone else can then bring it back to three dimensions and see how many steps you can yeah. go and then how it changes over time. Or, or, or a good structure. Everybody makes their own Play-Doh structure. Everybody passes it to the next person who then has to draw a map, who passes it to the next person who has to remake the Play-Doh structure. And yeah, boy, uh, I think it could be really interesting because my guess is a lot of the detail would get lost pr pretty fast. Just because it, it, it's hard to take what's in your head and turn it into to Play-Doh. So I, I think I had the harder challenge there by, by far. <laughs> Your, yours was, was easy. The structure was already there. You, you did a great job, Math Dad. Oh, thanks. <laughs> now, I'm going to pull up our world one more time and just mention real quick something cool about, about our, our map here of the world. Because you'll see that it looks like South America could fit into Africa. Like if you just slid this over, it would fit right here. And that's because the continents all actually used to be connected. And if you go far enough out in time, they're going to come back together again. Because right now we have a mid-ocean mid ridge down here that is spreading this apart, making the Atlantic Ocean bigger. Now this is a really slow process. It takes a long, long time. But eventually the Atlantic Ocean is gonna get so big that over here where we have subduction zones, you know, this ocean is gonna close, the other ocean is gonna get bigger, and eventually you probably will have the continents collide again. Although when you try and extrapolate that far out to see exactly what it'll look like, there are a lot of unknowns and there are a lot of different models that you can see. But when the continents were all together, we had what was called a supercontinent called Pangaea. And then you had ocean throughout the whole rest of the world. Will North and South America stay connected? Or are they projected they, to separate? They, I, I believe they're going to separate, but not for a long, long time. Well, that's just really interesting. Yeah, geological timescales are 
the type of thing that will just boggle your mind. You go out and you look at a mountain, and you're like, huh, how did that mountain actually get there? Right. And undoubtedly, there were natural forces that were over eons and eons uh, acting on it, pushing on it. Maybe it used to be taller, it's been eroded. Maybe instead it's been been, been pushed up. And yeah, it's been fa fascinating to think about and just leaves me shaking my head every time. Well, and, and I bet we all know from driving and following um, instructions from a GPS that if the roads or the streets change, then your map might have wrong directions, right? Sometimes that happens where you're driving, it'll say turn here, and you're like, well, there's construction. I can't turn here. Uh, that, that's, that is indeed true. Now, I think that we're ready for, oh, let, yes, let's talk about the inclinometer, and then Matt Dad has an awesome Desmos activity. Okay. I actually could not find my protractor in this house. It's been kicking around for weeks, and was, I know I'm going to do this demo, and I couldn't find it. So I hope you don't think less of me, because I'm as a mathematician who doesn't have a real protractor. But um, a, a paper, paper one is still a real one. I've pr printed out a paper protractor here. Okay, and I've tied a straw to it, and I've got this string, which is attached to the center part. So in this protractor, what we see is it shows all the angles from zero up to 180 degrees, and depending on which direction you start from, it's, it's, it's all there. And these protractors are, are good for measuring angles. So that's their, their entire purpose. And what I have here is we're going to call an inclinometer. And the, what it will do is it will let me look. And relative to my eyeball, I can look at something. And we can see what the angle of elevation is. So I'm actually pointed right now to the upper corner of the room. And if I get this thing to quit swinging, I can look down. So sexy says 70 is what it's pointed, pointed at now, although re really with the this was 90 degrees, and we went over 20 degrees to get to 70 degrees. You have to use the complement of the angle. So take, take whatever measure you see and subtract it from 90 degrees, and that will give you the angle of elevation that you're looking at. This inclinometer can be used to find your latitude on Earth. And here is how. You can't do this during the day, but what you can do when it's dark, you go out, and well, I assume you're in the, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you can do this. You go out and you find where is the North Star. And if you look at the North Star and then you use your inclinometer to see how or what the actual angle of elevation is of the straw, that will tell you your latitude. That the angle of elevation actually matches up with your exact latitude on the map. So I, I did create a little activity here just as a, as a way to, to explain this. So, so this isn't the, the cool Desmos activity Science Mom is talking about. Oh. But th this is a way of visualizing the what's going on here. So I have this is, green circle is the Earth. It's mm -hmm. a cross section of the Earth. And from the center of the Earth, this angle here, right now it says 16 degrees. That 16 degrees matches your latitude. It tells you how high. So if you went, if we went down to the equator, you call that zero degrees. And then if I start going up, now I'm at 27 degrees north latitude. And if I went all the way up to the North Pole, that would be 90 degrees north latitude. And well, whoops, you can't you can't go past 90 degrees north latitude. That, as far north as you can get, then you start traveling south again. But I want you to notice something. I have this vertical line attached to this point. Now, what could that vertical line actually mean? Well, what it means is that's the direction to the North Star. So the North Star it happens to be in a place in the sky that's essentially above the North Pole. So as the Earth spins, around and around, then what we're seeing is that the North Pole, sorry, the, the North Star stays put in the sky. It's always to the North. So all the other stars, they move throughout the night. I mean, they're moving so slowly that you really have to watch yeah, for quite time. a while. Yeah, yeah otherwise you, you can't see it. But the North Star is staying put. And it's so far away that it... Yeah, I can represent it with this vertical line, and you, you can't tell the difference. So 
even though I said it was above the North Pole and the North Pole's over here, the, the distance is so far, it doesn't matter. Well, that angle right here, relative to the center of the Earth, and the angle of elevation up to the North Star will always be equal to each other. In this case, really cool. 54 degrees, yeah, 54 degrees would be the angle up to the North Star. So back in the day when they were trying to navigate, they're out in the ocean or they're the explorers trying to figure out, well, where, where are we? They could figure out how far north or south they were using the North Star and a simple in inclinometer like this. Now, if you wanted to try to measure east-west, that would be a bit harder. A little trickier. Yeah, there, there, there isn't <clears throat> some fixed reference. And I don't think it was almost the 1800s before any good techniques came up. And even those were really difficult. So it's much harder to measure how far you are east-west by, by the stars than it is to measure north-south. One quick question I wanted to answer. Someone asked, how long until the continents come back together again? <clears throat> That's a really and good question millions and millions of years. It's going to be a long, long time. But the very first thing that will happen that everyone agrees on is that Australia is going to move north and run into Asia. So that, that will be the first because Australia is actually moving north faster than most of the other continents are moving. So that will be the first event, but it's not going to happen for millions of years. So all the Malaysian so islands, it's, it's all going to just merge together. Merge yeah. together. Yeah. Millions of years, though, and it's going to happen, you know, when I say Australia is moving fast, that's relative to continents moving, which means it still is going to take a very long time. Right. What I got to say, though, on a geological time scale, it, I, it's surprisingly short the amount of time that it, it will take because geologically, often we're talking billions of years. And it, I, I was surprised the numbers of okay, how soon this will happen. I was like, wow, that's soon. Yeah. Of course, it's long after I'll be gone. But soon in the geological sense. And I, I saw someone ask maybe because it's smaller and it's actually not the size of the continent so much as it is the, the cycles of how magma is moving underneath the earth that is causing the plate to move. So it's, kind of, you know, things kind of outside, of, completely outside of our control. Hmm. And now we're ready for fact or fiction. All right, science mom, true or false, map makers used to draw maps that were wrong on purpose. Oh, I know this one. So, and I know this one because it, it is true because map, maybe, map, map making is a lot of work and you would make a map and spend, you know, days and days drawing it with a lot of detail. And then if another cartographer just took your map and stole it and copied it, then that would be real, real sad for you, right? And so map makers used to, on purpose, they would actually put a fake name, a fake town somewhere where there was no town. And, you know, a real tiny town somewhere that was completely made up that was not real. So that then if someone copied their map and they saw that fake town that they made up on a new map, they'd be like, aha, I knew it. You took my town. Plagiarism. You guys didn't do your own research and yeah, take them to court over it. But I guess what? There, there's actually there was a, a real town that came about just because of a fake one on a map where people were looking at this map and they're like, oh, like it says. And I can't remember what it's called. But, you know, like, let's say it says Newport here. Like, well, let's let's settle here and call it Newport. That's right. It's like, oh, we're building a gas station. We'll, we'll call this one the Newport gas station. It, is, it starts catching on, and the actual settlements yeah. have arisen based so, off of fake names. So there was one time where a cartographer went to another guy and said, you're in trouble. You stole my map. And, you know, this town is a fake town. It's a paper town. Paper towns is what they called them. And the other map maker was like, what are you talking about? Like, I got gas there last week. There's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a real place. Yeah. So uh, kind of funny, dictionary Companies have done the same thing. Every once in a while, they'll put a fake word in there to say, oh, are my competitors not doing their research? Are they just copying my words? And yeah, they've been busted for that before. And it, Google Maps has actually uh, fallen prey to some fake map <coughs> news, so copying things themselves, but also have added a few fake roads themselves. That'd be frustrating with your GPS. Like, hey! <laughs> yeah, so. Adding fake roads in Google Maps is not allowed. Did they really do that? Like, yeah, it happened at least once, yes. <laughs> All right, true or false, 90% of Earth's population lives in the Northern Hemisphere. Ooh, 90%? Hand me the globe real fast. So for sure, most of our population and most of our land mass is in the Northern population, because look at this. If I'm, you know, below the equator, we've got this portion of Africa, Above the equator, we have a bigger portion of Africa, plus all of Europe, and essentially 
all of Asia as well is above the equator. So that's, if you just look at this side of the globe, that's a huge difference in land mass. But 90% of the population? I actually think it might be a little bit higher than that, <laughs> would be my guess. My, my initial guess was that 90 is maybe a little too low and maybe it's a little higher. Sarah sa says true. Scott says false question mark. Grace Saving Wolf says false. Ashley says true, read it in a book. Shweta says true. Claire says she lives in California. Shweta <laughs> says true. You know what? I'm all right, guys. I'm going with you. I'm going to say true. Okay. So I've also <laughs> marked this as true. And it, yeah, it's at least 90%. At of, least 90%, but could be higher. Yeah, I, it wasn't an exact number. And of course, populations change over time. What's, what's true today won't be the exact population tomorrow. But, but yeah, about 90% was the, the estimate. And I mean, that, that's a lot of people. And if you take a moment and consider, 68% of the Earth's land mass is above the equator, which only leaves 32% below. Is that including Antarctica? Because Antarctica is not the most habitable. That is including habitable. Antarctica. Yeah. That, that, that's so right. so if, if you think about it, yeah, Antarctica, that's a lot of land mass with no people. So that's not contributing anything. Uh, well, and I, the center of Australia, there, there just aren't a ton of people in that crazy arid desert. Arid. Uh, yeah. Um, at any rate, yeah, and, the, and then the yeah, and, and then South America. So much of this is, you know, the Amazon and jungle, and then a lot of this land is really arid, hmm. so not going to so have a high population. It, it, it just so happens that a lot of the land ended up in the the northern hemisphere, and and Did you most know? of the livable land is there as well. And this is why we have a cyclical um, change in car carbon dioxide concentration because in the summertime. In the summertime, like, you know, June, July, August, that summertime, then we have all of this photosynthesis happening in the northern half of the hemisphere, the northern hemisphere. And then in the wintertime, a lot of those trees are not doing photosynthesis because they're dormant and it's winter. And so you actually have this up and down of carbon dioxide concentrations global wide because of photosynthesis that happens during the summer in the northern hemisphere. Oh, kind of cool. That is cool. All right, science mom, true or false? Alaska is both the westernmost and easternmost state in oh. the United States. Ooh, Alaska is both the most westernmost and easternmost state. Um, I actually know this one thanks to one of our viewers who said it in their map when they drew a picture of Alaska. So the Aleutian Islands here, they actually cross the international date line. <laughs> so they are... Yeah, then technically it's like it's a day earlier here than it is on the other part of Alaska. So I'm going to say true. Yeah, it, it is true. It's kind of crazy that, yeah, the, I mean, uh, Alaska, we think of it as this huge landmass, but it has all these islands off the coast. And indeed, they yeah. do cross the international date line. A big chain of islands here. Yep. You know, so you're like, oh, it crosses the, the time zone. It's just an hour apart, but it's actually a day apart because of the, the way we measure days we had we had to draw the line somewhere where the new day starts and that's it where Alaska. it is so yeah it is both as far west as you can go and it's not as far east as you can go as well all right true or false the moon has less surface area than russia whoa the moon has less surface area than russia okay so russia is fairly big um how many time zones does russia have do you remember it's a ridiculously large number. We have four time zones in the U.S. I think Russia has seven or eight time zones. I, 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 seven sounds familiar. That's Although I, I know China is just as wide as the U.S. and they only have one time zone because they, they don't want to mess with, with changing time. So, so the number of time zones is probably not the best measure of, of how big something is. But yeah, it's, it's the biggest country in the world. And I know the moon is smaller than the Earth, but I don't feel like I have a very good feel for uh, crystal and marine and... Marine Man and Delia say true. I'm going to go with true. All right. It's not true. Dang it. No, it, this is false. Uh, let's see. Did I, did I actually <laughs> have the numbers here? So the area of Russia is about 17 million square kilometers, but the surface area of the moon is 38 million mm. square kilometers. So the surface of the moon is more than twice as big as Russia itself. However, if instead of saying Russia, I had said Asia, it actually would have been a true statement. Ah. Asia actually altogether does have more area than the surface area of the entire moon. moon. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, 
planet. I think of the moon is pretty darn sizable. And yeah, the Asia is Asia's bigger big. than I can imagine. Is All that right. the last factor fiction? That's the last factor fiction. All right. All right. It's time for math. It is time for math. Uh, but right. that cool Desmos activity, are you going to show them that? Or was that just thrown into the... Um. Okay. Yes, I, I, I will indeed show them this. So... And can I tell them a little story about the creation of this one? <laughs> you, you, you talk while I'm pulling this up here. So Matt Dad loves Desmos, as you guys may have guessed. And every now and then he'll get an idea and just be like, oh, I can make a Desmos activity for this. And this one, I still remember when he made it because he was so excited to show it to me when he made it. And this is his favorite Desmos activity that he's ever made. Um, it's called Degree Golf, and it's really pretty fun. That, that, that's right. So for those of you who want to, want to write this down, here, here's the code. Although there's also a, a link in, on, in on, on the Patreon. Patreon page. So yeah. XC7N96. All right. And then this full screen so we can see it. Oh, don't want to see the dashboard we want to see this okay so in this activity we are trying to golf so we've got this golf ball that's going back and forth between these greens this blue area is a water hazard in case you don't know anything about golf you do not want to end up in the water all right so my ball starts right here and i'm aiming for hole number one so we think about ang directions of angles and standard positions. So going straight to the right would be zero degrees. Going straight up would be 90 degrees. Straight to the left would be 180 degrees and, and so on. So for example, if I typed in here, I wanna go 90 degrees and I want to go 30 uh, units in 90 degrees, then, so here are 10 units. So I'm just gonna take the shot and see what happens. Oh, so I went straight up by that distance, 10 units. Okay, but I wasn't supposed to be aiming there. I was supposed to be aiming down towards one. So how would I get down towards one? Well, I need to go over and down. So that was more than 180 degrees, but less than 270 degrees. How far would that actually be? Well, I don't know, I'll just make up something. Let's go 220 degrees, sounds plausible. And for the distance, I probably need to go pretty far. I don't know, 60. Let, let, let's try it. I'm going to take my shot and oh, I went in the, my direction was good, but my distance was off. Okay, so let me change my distance. I'm going to go 45 degrees and I want to go eight units. So that's going to take me up and to the right and woohoo, victory. Woo so on hole number one, it took me three strokes. So from there, I would aim for hole number two followed by hole number three, and I bet you can guess what comes next. Hole number four. Yep, so th th that is the, the activity that I got. So in, in this sense, you guys are navigating a map as you go through this activity. You're trying to identify, all right, where am I? What direction do I need to go? And how far do we need to travel? And I, I've had some pretty bad directions given to me in my day. Uh, and this girl, tried, okay, so we're, I need to pick you up. Where do you live? All right. Well, you, you go past the grain grower's house. Or go, go past the grain growers. And then when you get to the stop sign, uh, don't, don't turn there. Just keep going. And then when you see the cow and you're like, ah, just <laughs> give me an address. To tell me where you're located. So it, it's important to be able to give directions. You can't let your GPS do all of your thinking for you in, in, in life, even though they're a lot better now than they used to be. All right. Okay, we're going to talk about symmetry. And in mathematics, symmetry actually has a very technical definition. I mean, we, we can talk about two things being symmetric. Like, for example, if I were to draw a face, there is some symmetry here, left to right symmetry. In theory, if I covered up half of this drawing and then reflected it across, the drawing would end up being the same if I had drawn it symmetrically, although we can see I put the chin off to the side. I, I, I didn't get my drawing to be very symmetric. And there's also this, this idea of things that are rotationally symmetric. So what am I doing there? So yeah, ro rotationally symmetric. So sh shapes like this, where if you rotate them, 
you would get the same thing. So what, what does a mathematician mean when he asks about a symmetry? Well, a mathematician means it's a mapping from an object to itself. So I'm assigning each point to a different point. So it has to be a one-to-one -one mapping and the distances have to be preserved. So let's, let's see. What shapes do we know have symmetries? Well, think about a square. What are the symmetries of a square? What can I do with this square that gives me a square when I'm done, but also preserves all the distances? And one thing I can do is I can rotate. I could rotate 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees. I could even rotate 360 degrees, which would kind of be the same as rotating zero degrees. I'd get the exact same map. So the do nothing and then three other rotations. But Science Mom, what other symmetries? Right across here. Ah, uh -huh. so it's... Science Mom would reflect this square across a line, and we, that would give us the square. Or this line. Oh, or a vertical. Or this or... line. Whoops, yeah. my line's not straight. That, that's right, and, and even the other diagonal. So it turns out there are four possible reflections. So this thing has eightfold symmetry. So there, <laughs> there, there, there are eight, eight symmetries to this specific object. So it, in particular, it has rotational symmetry, and that rotation can be 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees. But it also has reflectional symmetry, where you're able to reflect across a line and end up with the exact same shape. So those are two out of the, the three big types of symmetries. So reflectional symmetry and rotational, rotational symmetry. There's another type of symmetry called translational symmetry. So when mathematicians talk about translations, what they're talking about is shifting. So either horizontally or vertically or so, some mix of those. And there are shapes that have those types of uh, symmetry. So what's an example of something that has translational symmetry? Because a square, if I shift it over, well, then I don't have the square in the same spot. It, it does not have translational symmetry. So what about the number line? So I'm going to draw my number line with equally spaced uh, tick marks here. And it turns out this is an example of a shape that has all three types of symmetry. So it has translational symmetry because if I take my number line, and I scoot it over one number, I still get the same number line with the same tick marks and, and, and everything. You can't tell the difference. Or we could do a reflection. I could reflect across a line right here, and the number line would be the same, or I could reflect in multiple places. Or we could even rotate. I could rotate about this point, and we would still get the same number line. So we end up with all three types of symmetry in this shape. My uh, math mystery for this next time is for you to draw out the Venn diagram of the possible symmetry types. Do you guys want to hear kind of a funny story? So yesterday, we're I'm getting dinner, getting dinner ready, and Math Dad says, I just came up with a math mystery. Now I'm going to see if I can solve it. And it took him like 10 minutes. So so this one's, this one's a little advanced. I thought it was kind of... Half of that was just drawing it, though, tr tr trying to... I had to get my solutions here and it's, it's are, are it's, you sure you weren't struggling to figure it out <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um yeah it, it's, it's not the easiest one i've given you but actually i think it's entirely doable and it, it's worth playing with reflectional symmetry so there are one two three four five six seven different regions here can you find an example of a symmetry that fits in each of these regions. So in particular, uh, it's a hint, I just gave you the number line. Stretching forever and ever, that had all three types, so it's going to go in the center of our Venn diagram here. And, and then can you find shapes that would go in all yeah, the others? Yeah, can you find shapes to fill out this Venn diagram? So it's not an easy challenge, but also it's one of those ones where you just have to play with it. You're not gonna see the answer from the beginning. Okay, and then the answer to the last time's math mystery, we had uh, toothpicks that we were combining 
to make squares. And the question was, how many toothpicks do we need in order to come up with a certain number of squares? So in this case, if we needed seven squares, how many toothpicks would we need? And so here is how I would, would solve this problem. So, well, let me think of multiple ways of solving this problem. But so notice once we have these ones along the base, then each additional square, I just do draw two. So I can do my base and then two additional toothpicks are needed. Two additional toothpicks are needed if I have the left end done and the bottom end done. So in order to get seven squares, we would need, so seven along here plus one, so we would get eight plus two times seven. So that's eight plus 14 for a grand total of 22. It would take 22 toothpicks to draw, uh, or to, to get seven squares. How many toothpicks would it take to get n squares? Well, in that case, we would do this exact same line of reasoning. It would take n squares, or sorry, n lines along the bottom, plus one line along the left side, plus two times the number of squares, and so n plus two n, so if I had one n plus two more n's, that's three n's, plus one more. So it would always take three n plus one toothpicks to get a row of n squares. And let's just double check. When n is seven, three times seven is 21, plus one is 22. This answer matches with our formula. And you always want to check. Anytime you come up with a model, plug some things in, do, do that sanity check to see, all right, is, was this actually realistic? Did it actually predict what I know? So, cool. Thank you, Math Dad. I want to show well, you guys. So yesterday, you remember we talked about um, toilet paper and we talked about poop and like what happens to everything that goes down the toilet? Where does it go? And I want to give you a quick update about our little experiment that we did. So here is the toilet paper that we put in water and shook. You can see how it pretty much dissolved into this sludgy layer and it all settled <coughs> to the bottom. But our baby wipe and our paper towel are essentially unchanged. They are still completely intact. And then paper towel art was our art prompt. And here, after it dried, here's my Beware the Pit of Stench. <laughs> Don't the colors look cool? Indeed. So you can see that the Sharpie stayed the same, whereas all the colors changed. And I really had fun seeing the artwork that came in. But before we do our art show, I want to show you that shout out to Rishub, who made a heron's fountain. And there's a little video on Facebook. It works beautifully. They filled water in the top, and then you could just see it cycling and yeah. going. Had had to do it better than me. Good, good job, Risha. Yeah. Uh, oh, we're so proud. We're yes. so proud. This one is really tricky. So for anyone watching who hasn't tried this yet, I'll just give you a heads up. If you want to like put it together in 10 minutes like we tried to do, not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty tricky, but well worth the effort. Really cool. And now let's yeah, nicely done. I'm, I'm way tell impressed. you the art prompt for today All right. is to do a pendulum painting. So if you put in, if you don't have paint, you could do this over the sidewalk. Just put food coloring and water in a cup and then make your pendulum art on the sidewalk. That's totally an option. But make a pendulum is the engineering challenge. And the cool thing about pendulums is once they start to swing, they create pretty cool patterns. You'll see some really interesting patterns emerge once that pendulum starts swinging, it's not just going to go back and forth. It will typically develop some sort of circular momentum. And when it does, it's really cool to see. Yeah, we, we, we tried this and it turned out at first our paint was too thick. So, okay, let's try this again. We tried watering down the paint. Oh, our hole wasn't big enough still. All right. And yeah, it, it took a little while, but eventually we were able to get this to work. I'm going to share a screen and just show you real quick one of our better one of our better pendulum art creations, and then we will do our art showcase. Yeah. So using actual paint is a little bit wasteful, but uh, it was fun. It was fun. So you see how it, we've got this loop going back and forth now, but then pretty soon it's going to start to change direction. And our, our paint here was a little bit, I, I couldn't decide if it was too runny or too thick, but we were getting dots instead of lines. But now we're starting to go circular. And there's something really satisfying about seeing this 
this pattern develop, isn't there? Agreed. So I, I think this is a really fun, really fun art prompt. And whether you're using paint or whether you're using food coloring and water um, and just doing it, you know, maybe over the sidewalk, because food coloring will wash off. Food coloring will wash off the sidewalk, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe should, I should, should try this. Should, should, should work. But you know, this makes me want to do this in Desmos. <laughs> I, I, I should be able to code out what's happening here because I mean, it's the angles, it's slowly gaining in each direction, but it's swinging less and less distance. And yeah, yeah, th this is fun. It is. All right. Now it's time for our art showcase. Uh, oh, I have a, what's, has... what's in the bag for you here? All right. <clears throat> Give me the what's in the bag. All right. You're both in and outside of me. Both in and outside of me. You guide me, but don't ride me. Guide, but don't ride. Uh, I can make a statement with a tongue, but no mouth. What? Both in and outside of me. You guide me, but you don't ride me. I, I can, can make a statement with a tongue, but no mouth. What am I? I have a tongue, but no mouth. <gasps> A shoe, because a shoe has a Did tongue. someone give you that hint? No, Matt. Yes, I, I totally, I totally okay. got help from the chat. Okay. <laughs> I don't think I would have gotten it without looking at the chat. <laughs> the, so thank you. The, the, that's right. So you're in your shoes, but you're not in the shoe. You're just kind of really on it with it wrapping around you. All right. You guide me, but you don't ride me. We don't ride our shoes. And I can make a statement with the tongue. It's a fashion statement. And the oh. shoes do have tongues, but they do not have a mouth. I like it. I like it. Nice. All right. Now it's time for our art showcase. And I have to say to the 306 people who are still watching right now live, you just made it through a we're so tired. We're proud of ourselves for still being able to talk in complete sentences episode. <laughs> so thank you for sticking with us. All right. Art prompt. OK. Oh, we, we still have your video playing. We do. The, the volume's time. off. All, All right. right. The pit of stench, Greta. I love it. <laughs> and Paige and Kyle, these turned out great. Look at all the look at all the variety of colors. Oh, that's fun. Now I'm, I'm curious how wet these were. Whether they were dipped and in. The, so the left was stripes. The middle was folded with big circles. But then their favorite is the one on the right, where they just laid the other ones to dry. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Yep. Ah, Jaylee called this one the Northern Lights. It totally looks Very like the Northern Lights. Yes. Addison and Ethan, good job, you guys. And I, you can use coffee filters too. So I love the ingenuity here. No paper towels, no problem. Mm. Pull out some coffee filters. Sarah. Great work, Sarah. The, yeah, fun colors. Oh, whoa, Luca. beautiful job, Luca. These are so fun. I love seeing just the variety of shapes. Great work, Ilana. Ooh, different colored markers. Yeah, and the, the Sharpie one doesn't bleed. <laughs> oh, a beautiful yeah. rainbow, Ethan. I love it. Oh. Doesn't that look cool? Yeah, it does. That's a really fun effect. Renata, these look these remind me of like a tie-dye shirt. Yeah. Yeah, the colors are beautiful. Ah, oh, Rashab did a Venn diagram with washable markers, dry erase markers, permanent markers, and oil pastel crayons. I love the variety. Yeah, going on. I, I would not have thought that the oil pastels would have would have bled. So that's really cool. Very nice. Yeah. Science mom and writer <laughs> for the win. <laughs> so did Darth Vader and then sprayed it. And I love the way it changed. I sense a disturbance in the force. <laughs> nice. Ooh, um, Vivesh, wonderful lizard's eye here. <clears throat> Paper towel, coffee filter. Great work, Leah. And Caleb. Joyful journey, awesome. Hey. And Sirsha, I love it. It's like a sunset. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, yeah. Well, so much color. Yeah. Great work, Ivan. And Graham. Rainbow. Love it, Graham. Good job. <laughs> well, thanks right. so much for, for sharing this. So so the engineering challenge was also to build a pendulum? Yes. Yes. So our engineering challenge and our art prompt are pretty much combined for this time. If you, if you build your pendulum, then just attach some sort of a, a weight at, at the bottom that you can put liquid into. And that liquid can be paint, or it can be food coloring and water. And if you want to try and thicken it up a bit, you know, you can add a little bit of starch if it's too drippy. But I think that, you know, the splatters that you get, if it's really watery, are pretty cool as well. It doesn't have to be a line. 
And Math Dad tried yesterday doing one with sand. He was like, if we do a big bucket, we could just have sand coming through. How did that one work out? Uh, not, not so good. Yeah, we, we needed finer sand, but but also just getting it level so that it was actually hitting it each time. And maybe my, my object wasn't heavy enough. Yeah, it was a big fail, but it, yeah. it was fun to try. Yep, it was tricky. Oh, and I just got a text from one of our science moms saying, did Math Dad sing his song today? I'm singing a song. <laughs> I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long, but I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. So I think it's official. I think you're going to make it. This is episode 49. You know, we just have three more. I, I'm sorry. I almost did that to you guys. <laughs> you would have just been, something's wrong. Something's missing from my life all day. Yeah, that, I didn't mean to do that. But if you want some more of Math Dad, you can come back in just a few minutes because I get to do painting with a scientist today. Yes, so we have painting with a scientist today with Math Dad because tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific time, I'm gonna be on the show up, a live stream that Patreon is hosting and I'm super, super excited for that. So come come back in 10 minutes if you want to do some doodle art and knots with Math Dad. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for watching. Bye.